Hi, good morning, how are you? Um, so today I'm gonna talk about culture. I'm going to go into a few stories that I've worked on over the years, but what I wanna do with, with you is, is bring you behind the scenes a little bit, go into the techniques um, that I've used to, to gain sort of, you wanna say, access or um, enter the lives of these people. Um, talk about those methods, talk about the time it takes before and during the projects, and also the sort of internal and external uh, processes that I go through as a storyteller when creating them. Uh, the first story you're gonna see here is called People of the Horse. It was shot for Geographic. Um, it was published in 2014. And this is a story I worked with a writer, and what we were going to do is follow the horse through Native American culture. And we wanted to see Historically, um, the importance of the horse, but modern day, what were the economic uses today, culturally, spiritually, and just the daily existence of the horse in the lives of the people? With this work, um, you couldn't do a lot of research beforehand. I could do historical research and I could read, but I couldn't make a phone call and set up an appointment with anybody. Uh, so really what it was was just getting your boots on the ground and going out and they gave me the first month to just go out and meet people. And what I did was I looked first for public events, rodeos, um, pageants, powwows, things where I could see people out in the open. They might have horses, they might not, but I could start up a conversation that way. It was a lot easier than trying to make a phone call to a museum or knocking on somebody's front door. And that's where I met Destiny. Um, she's from the Wanapum tribe, and she was in, uh, she was in a thing called the Indian, Indian pa or Happy Canyon Indian Pageant. And this is at the Pendleton Roundup, if any of you know of, it's a very public event. But I went and spoke to her and her brother, and she said, being a part of this pageant is more than a beauty pageant. Um, I, it's a way for me to, to display who I am as a person, as a tribal person, the knowledge of my own language, the knowledge of my ancestors, and also the knowledge of this regalia. But Pendleton was a very public event, and I said, you know, maybe I could come back to your land at a different time, and you could display this for me. And that's exactly what I did, and this was taken, taken in Washington State. Um, this is Jones Benali, he's from the Navajo Nation. And I met him through friends of mine, and they said, you have to meet this amazing medicine man and, and horse man on the Navajo Nation, and I went down and I met his family. And he had been working in tribal health care alongside Western doctors as an Navajo medicine man. And he showed me, he said, the power of, of healing comes through the life force of the lightning and then through the horses, and that I'm able to trans, sort of transport into the people. Um, in exchange for some of the services he's done, he's been gifted these horses, and this was a horse that was given to him. And this is his son, Clayson. Um, a lot of the horses that are gifted to his father are wild at the time, and Clayson is known as what may, many people have heard of as breaking the horse, but he says we don't break the horse, we become one with the horse. And as I breathe on the horse and the horse breathes back onto me, we become one. Um, there's a group called the Appaloosa, Nez Perce Appaloosa Horse Club. Um, and it's a group of youth that every year follow the Chief Joseph trail ride. And this is a trail ride that was the escape route that Chief Joseph was taking and the people were following him to try to get into Canada when they were fleeing the Calvary. Um, these youth today, this is Brooke Taylor, she's 16 years old. She says, I ride this horse so I can feel the suffering of my ancestors. And that's how I know who I am and that's how I'm proud of who I am today. And I understand this land and I understand my people. And I also wanted to look at some of the economic ways of life, and also was there still subsistence living with horses. Um, of course, the first thing I looked at was the buffalo. Were people still buffalo hunting today? What was that? And um, there was, uh, now as many of you probably have heard, uh, several years ago when the buffalo leave uh, Yellowstone National Park, there's hunts that are available to four or five tribes that have the treaty rights. One of the tribes is the Shoshone Bannock. So I went in asking about the buffalo hunt, and they said, well, why don't you come out with us first on an elk hunt? Um, we actually prefer to go on foot or on horseback to get our elk. And, and I met them in the winter time, and that was from this hunt. Another thing I looked at was racing. Racing and rodeo, and this was amazing. This was a way for the young men and women to be proud of their athletic bodies, their sportsmanship with the horses, and this is how many of them are funding their way through university. 
this is on the Nez Perce Reservation, and this was one of the, the places I went. I, I, I knew that they had a tribal breeding program, and as I understood, it was the only tribal breeding program that was out there, um, but I didn't have any contact, so I actually just went on the reservation, and I went up to the tribal offices and said, could I speak with someone in cultural affairs? And that's where I met Nakia. And he said, actually, I have horses from our tribal breeding program. Why don't you come out to my house, and I'll show you. And he began to talk, and he sat on his horses, and I saw he's also one of the tribes that does that buffalo hunt, and I saw some buffalo skulls up top. And he sat on the horse, and he was walking around, and it was so bright and sunny, and for anyone in the room that's a photographer, that's kind of the death of your day. And, uh, and he said, I was looking around, he's like, what are you looking for? I said, I'm just trying to find maybe a shaded spot where I can take the picture. And he said to me, let me tell you a story. And he said, my great-grandfather is the, um, he began to talk about this land and how he, his grand, great-grandfather had ridden these horses here. And he said, his name is the one who can bring in the clouds. And he said, I got my name from him. And he goes, my name is Pile of Clouds. And within moments, we sort of had this beautiful cloud cover. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Um, and many of you might know of the Crow Fair. It's a very public event. And I went to the Crow Fair to meet people. The um, Crow have a really beautiful um, collection of regalia that they display once a year at this fair. Uh, but I wasn't interested in the very public event, but I went there to meet people. People were out in the open. And that's where I met the Walking Bear family. They had actually won one of the, the prizes of, of the parade. And I went and spoke to, to her, and she said, why don't you come back at a different time and come stay with my family? And a few months later, I went out and lived with her family for about, I don't know, 10 days or so. And I got to see moments like this. And she told me that in her tribe, a woman can braid her son's hair, on, and then once he gets married, only his wife can braid it. And for me, it was a very, very intimate and personal moment. And there, of course, is the horse in the background. Um, her children would come home from school, and they were pretty far out on the reservation, and they didn't go playing with other friends. They went and played with their horses. And I was also looking at some of the social issues and environmental issues that were going on, and as, um, a lot of the tribe reservation lands are having problems with wild horses, completely devastating the landscape. Um, there's a lot of other things that, that go into it, with slaughters being, being taken away. But I went out to see what was happening. Um, there And Yakima was one of the most well-known tribes that were having problems with over 20,000 head of wild horses. And uh, I went out with their group of tribal biologists. And, but I ended up meeting Patricia. And she, said, and she said, why don't you look at the art side as well? And she said, come back to my house. I have this beautiful chief's bag that my mother made, and I want to show it to you. So I began to look at how the, the horse was displayed through people's artwork. Um, this was out on the Umatilla Reservation. Here I went directly to the museum. I was interested in the horse mask. Were people still using it today? What did it mean? And in the past, it was used in war. It was used in hunting to kind of mimic your opponent. And you could find it during spiritual ceremonies. And today, you find it often in parades. Um, they took it out of, the, of their museum. It's one of their most prized pieces and put it on a horse for me to photograph. And in time, I worked on this project, thankfully so, for Geographic over three years' time. Of course, I wasn't there full time for three years, um, but that's exactly, we were kind of going to work on it for a year and a half, and I had gotten really, really, really great relations with people, and they gave me another year and a half to work on it. And I just became friends with people. I was out on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation many times. I just got a co phone call one day, there's going to be a wedding. Um, the bride's family is going to gift a horse to the groom's family. Would you want to come out? So I made some phone calls to the family and said, actually, you know what? Would you just want to be our photographer? So I came out, and I was their wedding photographer. I did all the pictures, but it allowed me to take this picture. And I gifted them with all the prints from the, the wedding for, them, you know, for doing that. And there's a lot of youth that you wouldn't know about that are involved in horses. And many, many tribes have this thing called um, the mirror concept. And what they say is that when we look at the horse, you see yourself. So everything that a horse does in front of you is something that you have inside of yourself. And this is on the three affiliated tribes, Manhan, Haratsa, and Arikara tribes. And the woman's horse said, when I see this horse, I see myself. I see freedom, and I see spirit. And she goes, but that? That transcends to all of us, all of us, tri all of our tribal people. This is all we are, and this is all we want to be. And finally, through those relationships I built, um, I got a call back for that buffalo hunt. It wasn't the one that was taken 
when they go out of Yellowstone. Um, this was a personal buffalo hunt. They do it uh, a couple times a year. The meat will be given out to elders, but the skull will be used for their sweat lodges. And that family called me. And um, I wanted to say today just about these techniques that we use when, when making pictures. For me, I'm not very objective. I tend to get very involved in stories. So after the buffalo, was killed, they take out the heart, and everyone that's there, it doesn't matter if you're the photographer from Geographic or if you're just visiting, everyone that's there is a part of that hunt then. And so they pass the heart around and you all drink the blood and you all take part in that. And that's how I was able to make this image. Big part of storytelling is you're always, if you've heard these issues, you're an outsider going in. Um, I always look at myself as just listening to the people and being able to sort of put the stories out that, that way, but there's also the people's own voice, and that's really important. I'm going to show you a short video we did with Geographic. You can hear how important the horse is through their own words. These horses, they're everything to us. They tell you when the seasons are going to change, the storm's coming. When bad people are around, when good people are around. They're your teachers, someone you could talk to, <laughs> your best friend. You know, some days he's your only friend. When you're feeling bad, they're, they're there. They take care of you and you don't know how. They don't they don't judge you. All they want to do is be loved by you. <laughs> they protect the little kids because they're so innocent. But at the same time they're they're just as nice. becomes you and you become part of them. It's a strong bond that you can't break. This is another story I did for Geographic in a really different technique and way of working. The first thing is the story was written first. I worked with Garrison Keillor. Um, for those that aren't familiar with him, he has his own radio show, uh, Prairie Home Companion. It's on NPR. He's been doing it over 30 years. And Geographic asked him to write a story called per His Personal Geography. Um, I was given the story and I ended up staying, living with him and his family over a year's time. Um, it's the first time I've ever been given the story written up front and then went and made the pictures. Um, when it was given to me, I handed it back to my editor and said, I can't do it. He'd so, he wrote so eloquently, I said, I'm not sure how I can take his voice over all these years and put visual images on it because he can do it so well in words. And she gave it back to me and she said, spend a little bit more time, think about it and come back to me again and we'll talk. And I did and what we decided to do was to take his text and use it as a map. And then I would take certain phrases and words and sort of visually find this and try to go back in time and, and recreate it. Um, this is a day I spent with Garrison. It's the only picture of Garrison I took. It opened up the story, but you won't see any other images of him. Um, we got in the car, we drove for five hours with no destination, and we pulled over and made this. And I started by I said I was living in his home, but now he lives in the Twin Cities, but I wanted to start back in his home home, his childhood home, as his story did. And uh, I met his sister. She gave me the keys to his mother's home, who had recently died, and she said they hadn't changed much, but why don't you go in and out as you please and spend time? So I spent a couple weeks just going in and out of his mother's home, trying to find things that, that would speak of, of Garrison's past. And if any of you know him, his religion was a big part of his childhood and how he sees the world. Uh, I found her Bible with her notes and, and photographed it. I would go around in these communities and try to look at the Minnesota of the past. Again, as he so eloquently described, what were little, little things that I could show that might speak about the past but were still present today. 
Um, I went back to his original community. His mother had moved, but he's from Anoka, and I went back there, and uh, I found his relatives that were still living there, the church that he had gone to, and I began following young boys that would have been around the same age as him um, as they did community service. Um, this was uh, children of his cousins. I would go out with them. We would go to church. I would see what they would do after church. Um, and pictures like this, again, these were relatives of him with different clothing. It could have been taken when, when Garrison was a child, and I liked that, and I wanted to evoke that. I wanted that nostalgia to come through. And then I began to go to church. I would go to the services, and then I would go to the Sunday school. I wasn't allowed to photograph during the services, but I could photograph during the Sunday school. And then as Garrison text, uh, through the text, he grows up. He begins to talk about Minnesota, not just his childhood. So I went to find these quintessential scenes of Minnesota during different seasons. The houses, the landscapes, broom ball, courts and people's backyards where love for Garrison, that's where love would bloom. And then he gets older and he moves to the city. He goes away to college and he starts talking about the city. And the Fauché Tower for him was a beacon. So I, what I did is I had my cameras, but I got very dressed up, like he might have done when he just first started college. And I went to the Fauché Tower, which is now a W Hotel, which you can still go up to the top and it's a museum. And I kind of imagined what it would have been like. And when I was finished, I walked outside and the moon was out and, and I took this image and I was so excited. And then I would um, go to local festivals, rhubarb festivals. Um, this was a car show. And I did this over a year's time, so I went in different seasons. And uh, I was able to make images like this. It could have spoke past, present, future, depending where you look in the picture. Um, Finally, Garrison begins to talk about love and then what it is to, to age. Um, and so I, I wanted to see how I could show love. And what I ended up doing is just making my own friends over the year there. And in the summertime, I would go out fishing with them. We'd drink beers. And then as I got to know them as my own friends, they'd say, oh, why don't you come ice fishing with us? In the winter, we can go ice skating. And through that friendship, I was able to see love. Um, I didn't have to go to a stranger and ask for that. I, they had been, become my friends, and, and they showed me this beautiful kiss. And this is the part of this sort of internal, external part of storytelling. After a year of being there, Minnesota became something to me as well. I saw myself um, sort of reflected in this story that Garrison was, was, was allowing me to tell. Um, and I made this image and see the city. You can see it's modern with the upright paddleboard and this, this woman in the water. And, and so these stories we do, as, as much as you want to say you're an outside observer, they become a part of you. And it becomes a part of my life. These are, this is my life too now. Um, and, and all of those things reflect in my photographs. Um, this is the latest project we have for Geographic. Uh, it's in the May issue. It's on Yellowstone National Park. It's a huge, it was an entire issue dedicated to Yellowstone. They had seven of us out there for, over, for about two years, um, off and on. And my job was to collect the voices of Yellowstone. But in order to do that, I had to understand the landscape first. And that's a big part of it, is, is once you can understand the language of the landscape, then you can actually begin to understand the language that the people are speaking. So I just went first to Yellowstone and, and didn't photograph any people. And we started, it, the story's on the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but I started at the sort of epicenter, Yellowstone National Park. Um, none of my landscapes are in the magazine, and that's not important at all. But this was my way to work into understanding the people. Um, and then people begin to emerge. And as I started to see people within the landscape, then I started my work. Um, I started working on the state feeding grounds. All, I call it the Greater Yellowstone Saga. It's, it, there's, it's completely polarized issues of what's happening in Yellowstone. Um, the elk feeders say, if you don't do it, all the, the elk will die, and we don't want that. And then the, on the other hand, um, it's all these elk together cause brucellosis. Uh, I went out with a lot of ranchers on all different levels. This is Hillary and her, her um, she's a range rider, and her entire lifestyle is on predator conflict management. Having a human presence in the landscape is how we deal with predators. So of course she took me to her home to photograph her children. John Craighead, any of you know him, he's a 
you know, amazing icon in, in the GYE. He coined the term Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. Also him and his brother, quite famous at National Geographic. At this point, his brother has already died, um, but I got to meet John. He's in his late 90s. He could, um, he couldn't talk at all, but when he did talk, he would count the rings on the trees or uh, point out a falcon he had uh, drawn on the teepee and said that he preferred to live in the teepee than inside. Um, and basically, for, again, those that don't know, all, all of the grizzly bear research we have today started with the Craigheads. And tourism, you can't talk about a place like Yellowstone without talking about tourism. Absolutely important, um, a huge economic revenue for the area. Uh, many of you see pictures of, um, you've heard it in the news lately, people bringing elk and bison into their cars, whatever silliness is happening. Um, I was looking for some of the more quiet moments to understand why people were going to the park um, more than just the animals. And I was driving and I saw this couple that had just set up a hammock. I stopped and they said they were moving cross country but they wanted to stop at, at Yellowstone first on this, this journey into a new part of their life. Becky Weed, another farmer, uh, excuse me, uh, another rancher. She has a small scale ranch. Um, and her, her first step in the landscape was predator conflict management, but now she says uh, she's got a new voice, and that is if you're gonna come out here and buy up land, work the land, become a part of the landscape. When you put a huge house in here and you don't work it, you break the landscape. In order to understand what the land needs, you need to know what it means inside of you. Um, and that's what she, she talks about now. Bill Hoppy, he was a big opponent of the wolf reintroduction. Um, another really important voice in the landscape. Uh, he said his grandfather is the first white man born in the Montana Territory. He says he's done being controversial, but he wants to, um, he wants to live the way his family has always lived. And he said, people all over the world come to Yellowstone and you all make decisions about how I live, but none of you have to see a grizzly bear when your wife walks out the door in the morning. Um, and here we see my friend back on the Shoshone Bannock Reservation, Leo Teton, and, and during this story, he is one of the ones that hunts the bison when they come out of the park. Um, we, I didn't go on a hunt with them, but he brought me back to his home for a sweat lodge, and all of these bison were taken during their, their ceremonial, ceremonial hunt in Jackson Hole. Um, we did the lodge, we came out, we made this photograph, so he said I could understand why the skulls were there and what that meant to them. Um, a few more minutes. I think I'm gonna go on to the last story. I'm a little bit going a little over time here, but very quickly, important is all the things that are showing you are assignment work, but you're all image makers and we all make personal work. Um, this is a very personal project for me. This, is, this started 10 years ago and honestly it will go on for another 20 years. Um, there's no outlook for it. I'm not looking for geographic or any other place to publish it. This is, this is my story this is, and this is what keeps me fueled, um, engaging in cultures and understanding new things. I went to Peru in 2006 for the first time. I sent an email to, uh, through a friend to this guy on a Hotmail account. I said, I wanna just come and learn something about your country, about traditional medicine, about how people relate to the landscape. And he said to me, um, send me some money in the bank, send me a copy of your passport, uh, send me a picture so I know what you look like at the airport. And he goes, but most importantly, think about why you're coming here. Because once you come to Peru, it'll be with you the rest of your life. And uh, I met people like this, Chippo uh, Shipibo in the rainforest. I had no idea what it meant, what I was looking at. And it was called, somebody said it yesterday in their speech, it's seed planting. Every picture you take is like planting a seed. This picture will take 10 years for me now to, now to understand. I'm actually working in the rainforest again, just beginning to understand what the land and the language means for these people. It's not the best picture in the world, but it's, it's again seed planting, feeling something, seeing that in, in the amount of time there I'm washing in the river, you're getting your fish from the river, you're, you're bathing in the river, you're smelling it, and, and these things become a part of you for now and then in the future. And fast forward seven years, I marry a Peruvian and my son's born in Peru. So uh, the guy was right. <laughs> um, through my son I learned Spanish and I continually go back um, I look at the landscape in a new way now, um, in, in, trying to understand the weavings, the landscape for my son. Then I look at understanding culture. You look at male-female relationships in the culture. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a parent in this culture? What does it mean to be an elder in this culture, to take care of family members as they grow older? 
um, what are the what are the folk folk traditions in this culture? I was sick one day, and my great grandmother took an egg and went around my body, broke it, and she said, "This is what's wrong with you, and now you'll get better." Um, looking at family, and again, taking these travel pictures. I'm still a tourist in Peru. It's completely new to me. Again, I take these tourist pictures, and I look at them as seed planting. Now I'm learning Quechua. I learned the. A, Different Spanish is just one level of Peru. There's other languages that describe the landscape, and that's important. And through these initial travel pictures that you're out taking, think about that, because they're going to, to help you um, sort of understand something in your own life. Very last story. Um, this is personal work that ended up my first story published in Geographic. I wanted to go to the Arctic. I wanted to understand the, land, the, the language of the Arctic. I wanted to understand if there were people that could um, interpret the Arctic as it was becoming more popular. Uh, and and wh what was their lifestyle? How were they living? And that brought me to the Sami people. Um, here's a short piece we did just to bring you there. Kalti maalle karasta la tuotta. Karra karasta. Muot. Oko porokaste ti maala. Tala vasa auki. Joo, ei mun tää tietää. Ja po, la verte voi trahaa, voi nästi. For this story, I did a very similar thing what I did in Peru. I sent an email to a Sami woman said, I wanted to come and learn about your connection to the landscape, learn about traditional medicine, and also learn about women's role in your culture. She invited me to come for two weeks, but the first thing she said to me was, we don't need someone from the outside coming in and telling the world who we are. We have our own voice. And I took that to heart, and she said, but if you're here to learn and to listen, we'll be very open to you. Um, and I ended up staying for four years. And she, after those two weeks, I went home, got things together, and I went back, and she gave me a map on a piece of paper, and she said, my, my husband's moose hunting. Um, if you can find his house, you can go stay with him and, and take part in that. And it was like two hours away from where she was, and I found it. So I have no idea how I found it, but I did. It was in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I walked in, and I wasn't exactly sure if it was the right house. There was only a couple out there. It had to be one of them. But, um, but there, there was a warm smell, like someone had just cooked, but there was nobody home. And this is the first thing I saw in the house. Um, and there was nothing else on the wall. And, um, uh, but I didn't know what I was looking at in the photograph. So I took this picture, and it would take about a year and a half until I understood what I was seeing in the image. And um, it's the most important part of the Sami way of life. Uh, it's a calf being marked. All, all reindeer calves in this region are owned. Um, it's it's uh, the start of the Sami New Year. It is what shows um, the sort of prosperity for the, for the people in the year to come. A few hours later, her husband came home, and at this time, he, he didn't speak English and I didn't speak Sami, so we just had to communicate. The first thing he did was give me a slice of meat. So you begin, like I said, kind of like in the, in the rainforest, you, you eat the food, and this begins this process of, of understanding the landscape. Um, and then he put his watch up to my nose, and it had this smell that I had spent a lot of time documenting hunting for years, so it had a smell that he had just killed an animal. And uh, that was his way of telling me they had gotten a moose and that we were going to go out and he was going to show it to me. And he took me out there. 
Um, he was with uh, his nephew, and when we got out there, he made it clear very quickly that he didn't really need me standing around and, and, and making pictures. Um, I'd be more useful if I could build a fire and make some coffee for them. And, uh, and so that would also sort of set the scene uh, for the next few years, I, I ended up working as a housekeeper for a family, um, and that's how I would learn uh, the way of life of the Sami. Uh, I followed the women's work uh, during their slaughters, saw what they did with the blood, how they would use it. Um, the first time I saw the reindeers, I will relate this to a Lindblad trip, as the, like the first time, if any of you have been on the Antarctica trip, and you see the penguins, you don't know where to begin, you don't know where to start, there are so many, how do you take a photograph of it? I was completely overwhelmed when I saw the reindeer for the first time, so I went off to the side and I saw this beautiful kind of display of, of antlers in the landscape, and that was my, my picture of the reindeer. I couldn't deal with the thousands of reindeer. Um, as time went on, I, I would begin to learn about the traditional dress of the people. That obviously, for me, they were, it was breathtaking and beautiful, but they meant so much more than that. It described who they were, where they came from, um, more specifically, your family. And this dress is called a gokti, and if you really knew what you were doing, you could tell who sewed the outfits. Um, it's so much today as if, if, if somebody, uh, a Sami person gets in trouble in, 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 with the law and they're wearing gokti, no part of the gokti can be shown in the newspaper because it'd be like identifying the person by face. Um, this is a, a young girl, Elili. I, I, I became really close um, with, with many families. She ended up living with me for three months in the United States. She came and did a cultural exchange on the, on the horse story, a kind of Sami and Native American youth. Um, but she told me that uh, everyone asked about her whiteness and this beauty. She said, we have the light reindeer and the dark reindeer, the light seasons and the dark seasons. Um, and, and we are light and dark people. And this would uh, eventually be the family I'd end up living with. Um, Niels Pater and Ingrid would show me almost everything I know about Sami culture. Uh, for everyone, that might seem like he's just sitting with reindeer, but today there's, there's modern technology, ATVs, helicopters. These are things I chose not to photograph. What I was looking at was what is the connection of the Sami people to their ancestral roots and their past? Um, and it was very specific. This is not a reportage on Sami people. It would be a very different, different look. Um, uh, but in order for him to have the reindeer so close, what it's telling you is he doesn't use a lot of those things. It means he's literally walking with reindeer. And reindeer herders are called boatsubatsi, or reindeer walkers. Um, the landscapes, for me, feeling the landscapes, you've probably seen through this, is very, very important. And what I realize is these, the Sami, the word for I live is, is moon oran, which means I dwell here for a short time until I move on. The Sami were traditionally nomadic, today they're semi-nomadic. So all of these permanent structures really held no, no importance in the landscape. And every time I tried to photograph them, I felt like they kind of floated away. Um, but it also sort of spoke of the, of the way Sami people thought about permanent structures. Um, this is the lava. This would be similar to a Native American teepee. This is what they use when they're traveling. It's what they used in the past. And, and, and for me, as a storyteller, my perspective began to change. I woke up one morning, and this was my landscape. And I remember saying, I feel more at home here than I've ever felt anywhere. And that's when I realized that the Sami people had allowed me for the first time to see as much as you can something through their eyes. And I realized that my perspective had changed. In the beginning, I wanted to be close to the faces, close to the reindeer. But I realized that the Sami, when they, they, they never got close, they saw everything at a distance. That's how they knew where the reindeer were. That's how they knew how the, the, what was coming in with the weather. Um, and when you look at the, the Sami paintings that are usually done by herders, it would always be from this perspective. And so through that, I was, I was allowed to make images like this when I under, began to understand that more. Um, this would be the house that I worked in, this kitchen that I cleaned and that I cooked in. And, would prepare skins in and help, help with the children. I made this picture the first time I sort of saw this uh, carcass on the table. About a year later, the same scene would happen, and I would just sat, sit down and, and, and drink a bowl of soup, and I never took a photograph because it became so normal. So there is this beauty of, of as something when it's new and, and in time, you, you tend to overlook it. Um, and 
also with the Sami, like, like with my family, um, I learned Sami language. I went to Sami University for a year, and it wasn't until I learned Sami language that I could appreciate the beauty of things like this, because in these tents are when the stories were told and when people began to um, actually talk about the past and their ancestors and their spirituality, and it was only done in Sami language. It wasn't done in Norwegian or in English. Um, hard work, super hard work. My images look really romantic. It's extremely hard work. You're working in minus 40. People show up at weddings, face burned, um, frostbitten. Um, it's probably my, one of my only pictures that shows maybe the physicality of it, but it's extremely hard work. Um, and when they rest, they rest like this. Um, uh, again, by learning the language, I could begin to, to have moments like this, go inside the home with elders when they were sewing, um, learn what things meant. These aren't just beautiful little curves or elf shoes. These were how they would hook into their skis. Um, being out, getting the fish, cutting grass, learning the significance of this, when you cut grass, when it can be used. I learned to prepare skins. Um, skins like these will be made for the, the baby's cradles. And these are the last image. I'll bring you to the last story. Um, I saw this man on my first trip out there, and I wanted to photograph him. His face, his being was really, really strong for me, and I never had the chance to until the end. And I look at storytelling as a way that you never, you know, it's the beginning, the end, or the end of the beginning, um, and, and you never know who are, who's going to be your guides, or some people call them fixers or translators. You never know who, who they're going to be. Um, and Sven, for me, um, was this in the sense of if you, anyone's asked you, do you know when your story's over? And that's a really big question. I never know when it's over until it's over. And uh, at this point I said I would learned Sami language uh, so I could be with him. He didn't speak English. And he was the one who watched his reindeer in the winter and he watched them by himself and he invited me to come and spend the winter with him. And, and so we did. And um, the last image here, we were out in the landscape and we saw this in the distance and we went up to it and I didn't know what I, what I was seeing. And, and he went up and he started futzing with the, the antlers and, and I saw all of a sudden he got really sad and I was thinking to myself, I'm not sure why, he's, he's been slaughtering reindeers for 70 years, it can't be the first time. Um, and so I asked him and he said that they, two female reindeers that had, had been fighting, so their uh, antlers locked and they had starved to death and he, he estimated it took three days of time. And he said this was sad for him because he knew that they had suffered. And I said, um, that's it. Like he, um, he released me from this story. I had learned everything that I, I was meant to learn there. My, one of my initial questions is, what did it mean to be human in this landscape, to be human in the Arctic? Um, and it's the thing that we have inside of us, this connection to life and to suffering. And, and he, had to, he showed me that. Um, and after this, I left. So thank you. <laughs> Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.